Hello, welcome to Biggest Little Library. I'm Tammy Ruff. And I'm Amy Newberry, and we're two librarians discussing all the books in the stacks. The new and notable. The lost and forgotten. The hot and the not. But before we get started, we wanted to remind you guys to head over to our website and subscribe to our newsletter because we're actually getting ready to take a little bit of a break. We are. And that's how you're going to keep in touch with all the cool things that are happening in Biggest Little Library because we're still working and reading. We we're are. just not recording. Do you want yes. to tell them what else we're going to be doing? Well, we're going to re-release eight of our, our episodes. Favorites. of our Yep. From our, I think they're all from the first year, although I'm not positive about that. Yeah, I'm not I sure either. That. <laughs> I'm not sure. Um, but the Friday Fours will all be new content so That's that you right. get more new books to put on your TBR. I know. And today we have the four of us here. Super yes. excited. Jamie's here and Taryn is here. Yes. Say hi, girls. Hi. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> um, before we jump in, what are y'all, what's everybody doing? Don't everybody talk at once. Mm. Taryn, what are you doing? You're working, right? I'm working now, um, which makes me sound like a, a little bit of a layabout, but yeah, I took last year <laughs> off. <laughs> um, but yeah, I'm working at, or I'm working at a private golf course in California. Um, so. Are you getting any golfing in? Not yet. Are you hoping to? I'm hoping. Saturday, hopefully. That's but an, it's an, been the start of the season, so the tee sheet has been full. Mm. Um, and obviously, like, staff gets less priority than the members who really? pay. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's so. a pretty ritzy place. It I is. Mean, I don't know if we can actually say, but it is a huge chunk of change to buy in. I'm sure. And then it's like still. Like a little over a quarter million. Yeah. And it's in Truckee. It is in Truckee. That's that's all we can reveal. I know, and mm-hmm. there are a few of them there, which I had no idea until she got the job. So that's very cool. Yeah. yeah. What else? Well, I am sleep deprived from <laughs> Mab, but it's it's all good. She's it's adorable. It's like having a baby. It's isn't mm-hmm. it? It's like a newborn. Well, and you get one house train, so it's like one out of diapers, <laughs> and then you get another <laughs> one. It's like having a second one in diapers, but. But she's doing well. Mm. It's just, you know, you get up at 7, or not 7, like 1.30, 2.30 in the morning, and then at 5.30 in the morning, so. Oh, my gosh. Wow. It's a little early. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, you want me to tell you about something great I watched? Yeah. Okay, so there is, um, it's a documentary, and it's called The Booksellers, and you can watch it on Amazon Prime, and it is so cool. It is about the booksellers, like in New York City. <gasps> And the antiquarian book sales and like um, Fran Leibowitz is on it. And it was just the coolest thing. It took us a while to watch it, you know, because we got interrupted with yeah. the dogs and everything. <laughs> is it a series yeah. or like a documentary? Nope, it's a documentary. So it's just one, I think it's an hour and 45 minutes or something like that. But it has the quirkiest people who have held on to all of these books for so long and want to sell the books and they have conversations about well what's going to happen in the future because people don't want books anymore they it doesn't really matter to them and they're like no it still matters and um it's just re- it was really really interesting to watch it sounds right up my alley do you have amazon prime jay we do yeah yeah mm-hmm. i think we need to watch that yeah that's really that good sounds great that's- from 2019 I'm going to mm, put so. that like maybe first in my right. summer to-do list because cool. summer. I know. Yeah. It's so <laughs> close. Yes. <laughs> well, that's cool. And yeah. Jamie, I know you're in the middle of moving. I am moving classrooms, which is no small feat after teaching no. for 20 years. I have a lot of stuff. I know. It's. I keep telling people it's embarrassing. I'm embarrassed by how much stuff I have. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm hoping that when I get settled into my new classroom, I can find some time to clean some stuff out. Yeah. Yeah. That's the it's, great wish. Yeah. Has that ever happened for you, Tams? Well, I cleaned out a lot, you know, when I left the classroom and went to the library, but there were probably eight boxes that I couldn't Partly. bear to get rid of. Because I thought, well, what if I end up back in the classroom again? Right. And then I didn't. And let me tell you, it was super fun to get rid of those boxes. <laughs> like, bring that dumpster over here. Yeah. <laughs> I sort of very carefully separated a lot. I did a lot of recycling out of it. So I mm-hmm. took a lot of the plastic stuff out. And then I took all the paper and, you know, all that kind of stuff. So I recycled wonderful. right over to this lovely lady right, right here. Which I'm, like, I'm super that. thankful here for. Because <laughs> it's all amazing stuff. Well, but I have a lot of it. And it's hard when you don't know from year to year or school to school what you're going to be teaching so then you tend to hang on to things and yeah get you get scared to get rid of it 
Is, so there should be a, a reality show teacher hoarders. Oh gosh, because we are. It's yeah. a problem. Yeah, it is. I mean, that's why. Look at my back room. I'm like, I get it cleaned up, and then it gets right back to this spot again. So whatever. Well, there, it's the hub here, so there's a lot that comes and goes out of the library. So. I might need some of these things. Right. Mm-hmm. You never know. Right. So. That's right. And how about you? <sighs> I'm so ready for school to be over. <laughs> right. Is it bad to say that? Like, you know, when you just reach the end, we're, when we're recording this, I think it's safe to say that we're just a few days away from being done. <sighs> I still have 500 books out. 200 laptops out, you know, that kind of stuff. And then, oh, by the way, get your end of the year statistics and data put together and put it into a cute report and send that off, will you? Could you get that done for me? (laughs) So (laughs) cleaning up destiny and I'm just, I'm mentally fatigued. I'm so ready. I'm so ready. I think we were talking about it. um, A few teachers, we were talking about how this year feels different (sighs) Because it's been such a weird year mm-hmm. and taxing in different ways and maybe more mentally taxing than other years have been. And all of us were saying, no matter where we were in our career, this is the most ready we've been for summer in however many years each of us had been teaching. I would agree. Yeah. It's been really a challenge. And um, people are making a joke because I have been taking a few days off here and there. They're like, <laughs> you going to be here on Friday? <laughs> Because it's been like no work for Amy on Fridays, like la- <laughs> librarian holiday or whatever. So I am going to be here for the last Friday. Oh, nice. um, we watched a great show on okay. Netflix called Spotlight. Have you ever seen this? No. Yes. You, you about, did? It's about the newspaper. It's about the, um, yeah, about the mm-hmm. newspaper that didn't break the story on the Catholic priests back in like the 80s, I think. That were, I mean, this is really dark, so I'm not going to go too deep into it, but it was like the all the molestation mm-hmm. charges that mm-hmm. were covered up for you know, like decades wow. and how they surfed these priests around. And mm-hmm. so it was really, really interesting and like a lineup of big stars. I know. Yeah. yeah. So we really enjoyed it. We were riveted. It's a series? It was just a movie, but oh. it really made me think I would like to do some reading on just that pocket of time because it was set in Boston and as you know they have a very large Catholic population and so it was you know and there's this protection element of like protect the church protect Mm -hmm. but at the same time a lot of people were really damaged and very hurt by all that right Mm. it was fascinating Kevin and I were like we had no idea because it happened it broke around 9-11 and so, of course, 9-11 happens, and that kind of, like, takes precedence in the news, or, pre- you know, right. it takes over the news. Mm-hmm. And so, um, it just was really, really interesting, and all these different key players, and, like, the statistics that were involved in figuring out, like, how many people they possibly were looking for. It was fascinating. So, Spotlight on Netflix, if you want a dark one. <laughs> <laughs> I think it won some awards, Academy Awards, too. I'm not surprised yeah. to hear that. There's, like I said, a lineup of really like a very diverse giant cast of big hitters. Mm -hmm. So I would highly recommend. I don't know. So anyway, so today you three are super (laughs) excited about this. (laughs) Yes. I'm just excited to hear about food, period. Um, And I'm not as prepared. So I guess we were talking about, tell us what we're talking about. Well, we're talking about cookbooks. Okay. And there are a couple different, I mean, there's not a couple different kinds. There are a lot of different kinds of cookbooks, but I did a little bit of a deep dive into <laughs> shocker cook- cookbookery. Nice. I don't know. Is that a word? Yeah. <laughs> let's make that a word. Yeah. Cookbookery. So any idea when the first cookbook was actually published that had, well, this is, it's a very famous one and I'll tell you why it's, it's significant. Let's talk about the, maybe a year. Hmm. Was it 1968? No, but you're pretty close. I I have no idea. Do you I know? don't either, but I'm thinking like the the most significant cookbook that I ever see is the one with the red and white, the Betty Crocker. Betty Crocker. Oh, red yeah. and white cover. That's, but, that's one of the top ones. Yeah. But the one I thought was really interesting is 1896 Fanny Farmer, which oh. is rings a bell for me. Mm-hmm. Um the Fanny Farmer cookbook because she was the first person who used level measurements. Really? Mm-hmm. Otherwise, we didn't have, you know, they would say, you know, use a handful of this. A pinch, or, a dash. Mm-hmm. <laughs> right. They didn't have actual measurements. So home cooking didn't turn out that well because 
they, you know, nothing was really standardized. And then even with, and you probably remember, and well, I had cooking in, in school, in middle school, we had cooking class. They and offered it. Spoon it in. Did yeah, you? I didn't take it, no, but I they did t- offer. Yeah. Well, we had a wheel, exploratory wheel, which I th- wish they still did. And so you rotated through sewing, cooking, um, sex ed and I can't remember what the other one is and you spent like three or four weeks in each one and so every nine weeks or 12 weeks you moved into another wheel and so you you know we made our way around did lots of things drafting and wood shop and you know all kinds of things and so but my point was in cooking she was very and her name was um Mrs. Baker <laughs> I thought it was so funny you know level uh, or you know um spooning up the you know measuring and not dipping the measuring cup in and then leveling it off so that you had you know something that more consistent yeah matched whatever what year was this 1896 so that was the first cookbook with level measurements with level measurements yeah Yeah. okay Mm -hmm. is our english cookbooks don't they use a different measuring component are they still using like we do cups and things do they do Mm -hmm. that so like I know that a British pint is 20 ounces and an yeah. American pint is 16 ounces, but for baking and everything, they're going to use weight, okay. magic weights. Okay. Like when you watch the Great British Baking Show mm-hmm. and they're weighing all of their ingredients. I found exactly. that fascinating when I first, because I'm pretty addicted to that show. I know. I love it. Oh my gosh. I love it so much. And so the first time I watched, I was like, what are they doing? They're measuring everything. Which is way more accurate, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. which I had no idea. I had no idea until um, I got a sourdough starter. Oh, right. And it tells you when you feed your starter to uh, weigh everything. Mm-hmm. And it huh. says you can measure, but unless you weigh, you're not really going to get the accurate measurements. And I was like, oh, well, that's, that makes really? a lot more sense. Why don't we measure like the British do in our baking? Right. Because it, it makes more sense. It does, but you'd have to have like a little scale in your... Yeah, but that's, they're very, like yeah. I have one. They're mm-hmm. really easy to come by. Yeah, huh. we, yeah they're we cheap do. now. Uh, well, yeah. I'm not surprised you do, Tammy, because <laughs> you, you're a cooker and you have things. Like you, if I need something, I call you. I'm like, hey, I need more platters. By the way, could I borrow a, yeah. you know, fill in the blank. Yeah. You're the girl. Huh. We do have stuff. I don't yeah. have a scale. All right. Okay, yeah. well, Fascinating. So I thought that was interesting. And then I, I looked at a few blog posts about, you know, the best selling cookbooks. And so Better Homes and Gardens, which you mentioned, was one. Betty Crocker was another one, which, you know, sounds familiar. Um, the Atkins Diet. And ni- we're now we're up to 1997. Super popular. Very. Um, going back to the 30s, The Joy of Cooking. Mm-hmm. That one's mm-hmm. still around. Mm-hmm. Um the Frugal Gourmet, which I remember seeing him on PBS <laughs> <laughs> way back when. Yeah. Um, and then, of course, there's Mastering the Art of French Cooking. You can't talk about cookbooks without talking without about Julia. Julia Child mm-hmm, yeah. and her cookbook. And then um, even the South Beach Diet Cookbook. Oh, yeah. That one is the best seller. Yep. Everybody was doing that. Oh, mm-hmm. yeah. In the early 2000s, I think. Mm-hmm. Yep, bags we have it. Bags yeah. of almonds. Everybody's walking around with their almonds. Yep. Yeah. And then even a vegetarian, the Moosewood Cookbook, which, um, you know, I have a friend. And when we taught together in middle school, she had the cookbook. And so I have a couple of recipes that I've made gluten-free now, um, like tabbouleh, which I can't have the bulgur wheat, but we use quinoa. So mm. that's cool. Yeah. So I just thought it was kind of interesting to, you know, to look at, these old cookbooks. I'm kind of surprised the Boston Cooking School cookbook, which is by Fanny Farmer, didn't make it as a best-selling cookbook on right. your list. Nope. It did talk about that somewhere along here because that's familiar to me, but that is where she got, that's where it started with at the cooking school and actually making, you know, the, the measurements so that everybody could get the same results. I so. wonder how many of those went into circulation. Like, were, was there a, a demand for buying these cookbooks? Did people have the resources to do that or the, you know what I mean? Well, mm-hmm. I yeah. know that the Boston Cooking School cookbook was huge at its time. Um, like, I, I mean, not that this is a representative sample, but the, the cohort that I was getting my food masters with, mm-hmm. multiples had Boston Cooking School cookbooks because historically it had been so important and was like kind of 
a big, I mean, it was a big deal. The right. Boston Cooking School and the cookbook and Fanny Farmer. Huh. So that's why I'm shocked it didn't make the mm-hmm. bestsellers list, although maybe got edged out by Something. stuff like, yeah, um, The Joy of Cooking, which is, you know, had a million editions. Right. Mm-hmm. right. Mm-hmm. So. Okay. So what do you guys, what, what cookbooks are you going to entertain us with today? Well, I thought I would ask a few questions okay. about cookbooks because, you know, there's, there are just so many different kinds. And so I was wondering, Jamie, if you remember the first cookbook that you ever received. That's interesting because I don't, which is shocking. As I started looking through all my cookbooks, I was like, I don't, I don't know what is the first cookbook I received. So one thing I do have um, that I didn't bring is that my mom put together a little like recipe book where, she, you know, you slide the, the recipe cards in for yeah. me. Um, I think maybe when I graduated from college, that's when she gave it that's to me. That's sweet. I love yeah. that. Yeah. So there's all kinds of fun recipes in there that she and she wrote out the little recipe cards. And it's all stuff that we had growing up. Mm-hmm. So like her chili with beans and um, stuff like that that she made, you know, that. Yeah. yeah. And she, I think to her credit, she did try to teach me a lot about cooking and she did but I also at that time in high school and college I just wasn't really interested in it which Mm -hmm. is shocking because I love it now Mm -hmm. so cooking and baking are two of my favorite things to do and cookbooks are I don't know why but I get very excited about cookbooks (laughs) right (laughs) you mean you'll purchase one uh, shocking. Yes. Yeah, I will yeah. purchase a cookbook after I've checked it out from the library to make sure that, <laughs> <laughs> that it's going to be worth yeah. the cut. Just yeah. to qualify that purchase right there. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. That's a genius tip right there because we've done that like with when we started eating having to eat gluten-free I bought a couple of cookbooks and I'm like this is terrible it's awful and then you're like hmm right. you know there goes that money so right. I've done that ever since Let's get it from the library to check it out yeah here's, here's a fun fact about library cookbooks one of the libraries that I used to uh, volunteer at when I was in college the cookbooks, without fail, that were the most, were, like, circulated the most were the Guy Fieri cookbooks. Really? Really. really? I had, like, I multiple ha- copies of all of them, and they were always, always going right out the door. I used to make hold calls on them all the time. You're kidding. No. That's I don't think I have any. I'm going to put that on my to-order list, because maybe. Yeah. You know? I don't have any of those. Yeah. No. Uh, it was really interesting to me. Yeah, I mean, somewhere in upstate New York, there's a small town that is a big (laughs) fan. (laughs) That's hilarious. Oh, that's funny. So do you have a cookbook that you purchased then for yourself that you love? That's the cookbook that you use a lot of? Well, yes, I have um, this Thug Kitchen is probably my go-to cookbook. Okay. And um, it's all, if you don't know about Thug Kitchen, it's all vegetarian recipes. And the cookbook is very irreverent. I mean, <laughs> mm-hmm. it has swear words all over it. And so I was um, talking about it with one of my friends who had smaller kids. And I was like, oh, I don't think you can leave that out on the counter, you know, to make your recipe when there's, you know, the F word splashed across the page. So <laughs> it definitely has a specific audience, but the recipes in it, Everything I have made out of it is fabulous. They're pretty easy and accessible for vegetarian cooking. Because I feel like sometimes you get a vegetarian recipe Mm -hmm. that's like, you need 900 ingredients to make it taste like this. And that's not really what I want. So this is all about using like whole food ingredients. Mm -hmm. So I, I appreciate that about it because that's pretty much how we like to eat. And there are recipes in here that I go back to all the time that are good standbys at our house. I love it. Yeah. Cool. I just love the title and the fact that the F word is in there. Not that I love the F word, but you know, that could draw a whole new audience of a reader. It is really fun to go look through there too, Mm -hmm. because I've done that at a bookstore. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. Yeah. It's a good one. And I've given this as a gift too, to vegetarian friends in my life. Nice. All right. Well, Taryn, how about you? All right. What's your first cookbook that you remember receiving from I'm sure it was me yeah I was just gonna (laughs) say hmm, the very first cookbook that I remember receiving was probably a gift from my sister and I which was Rachel Ray used to have this kids cookbook that we still actually keep and we make one of her recipes from meatloaf muffins all the time out of it but the first that I got on my own and I can't remember who it came from because it could have come from 
mom or it could have come from my grandmother, but it was the Joy of Cooking Bridal Edition. Really? Really. And I used to make cinnamon rolls, pre-celiac, all the time out of it, like homemade four-hour cinnamon rolls. That's so, wow. So cool. Yeah. Yeah, who knows? I don't remember if that was me or my mom. (laughs) I think it's such an odd, like, how old were you? I mean, probably 12. So 12, you got the bridal edition. <laughs> like that's it was old. probably like the one that was at the grocery store, or like, you know, at the bookstore, vis- at the bookstore Invisible. That is so adorable. Yeah. That is cute. So it's in my closet somewhere or in book jail. In book jail. Uh, I guess book jail's gone. Book so yeah, it must, be in the, it must be in the closet. I think that's so cute. That is cute. 12 year old Taryn, here's your bridal edition. <laughs> Joy of cooking. Funny for so many reasons. <laughs> it is. I know. <laughs> yeah. I know. I love it. Well, then you want to talk about books that you've purchased for yourself? Yeah. For your food journey? I've become a bit of a cookbook collector, but cookbooks of a very specific type. So the cookbooks that I tend to purchase for myself are much less books that just have, that are recipe books, Mm -hmm. but are books that are food history, food culture, kind of bound up in them so um or have like agenda sounds like not the right word but like an agenda so the one that I brought to share today is the Sioux Chef's Indigenous Kitchen um Sioux is in S-I-O-U-X um the tribe or nation yeah I love that Mm -hmm. so this book was a James Beard award winner which for those who don't know is like a food foundation that Um, gives awards to like best restaurants, best books, best podcasts, best newspapers, best writing. Best chef. Best chef. Mm -hmm. It's a really big deal in the food world, this award. Um, James Beard was a chef, a very famous chef. Um, So this book came out in, I want to say 2017. I was right, 2017. And it is Chef Sean Sherman's um, book. And it is, I just want to see it. Want to see the cover. Mm -hmm. And it is the first um, decolonial cookbook I ever read. So everything in the book is like North American foods with a lot of focus on things like forage, like foods that are forageable. So um, like there's one page dedicated to like a bunch of different tree sugars. So not just maple, but birch and Douglas fir and how these are collected and how they would have been used. Um, and then recipes for them because the way to get people to like save these food traditions would then be to eat them. So I've made a couple of things. I made a couple of things out of this book. Um, there's like a butternut squash apple soup. That's really good. Um, if mom was a little bit more game, there's (laughs) game recipes in the book. You don't Um, want to catch rabbits in your backyard or, you know, my friend raises meat rabbits. Okay. um, In her backyard. But yeah. (laughs) Jamie's like, no. (laughs) Yeah. no. Our vegetarian friend over there is like, let the bunnies live. (laughs) Oh, the poor bunnies. I mean, they live good lives. I'm sure they do. (laughs) (laughs) Tell their nom, nom, nom. Yeah. Um, Right. (laughs) But yeah, so it has lots of different things like pheasant and quail and things that you would you would eat or could get here and it has different stories about like hunting and growing up on um, a reservation and preserving indigenous food ways like acorn bread that have been kind of um, trampled by the you know like the um, like reservation diets of like you know like white flour delivered by the U.S. government right so I years ago actually like two or three years ago went to um my sister-in-law had a Thanksgiving that was all, what do you call it? Decolonial? Yeah. Like colonial. So like it, the native menu. food? Yes, it was all, it was all like native indigenous foods. It was great. It was great. Yeah. I mean. But it the, took a lot of effort to make it happen. So, so. Mm-hmm. the nice mm-hmm. thing about this book too is that these recipes are accessible. You don't need a million ingredients that you've never heard of. For instance, um, like I'm looking at the random page I opened it to is maple juniper roast pheasant. But like you can use chicken and like right. who doesn't have maple syrup and a lot, you know, juniper berries or something you can buy right. at the grocery store now. And there's nothing right. super, you know. Can you pull the juniper berries off your juniper? Well, <laughs> is that a thing? They take, no. Can you do that? I don't they know. take multiple know. years to 
be ready that I think. Okay. I, think. I don't know. These are so I don't know how you would know. Yeah, I don't either. Worth a Google. Worth a mm-hmm. Google. Uh-huh. <laughs> but yeah, like butternut squash apple soup. Yeah. You know, that's not hard. So it's a really interesting way to like realize what foods are native or like what food might grow around you that you don't know about. Yeah. Um, you know, like for this area, you used to be able to go forage. I think they're pronounced camas bulbs, C-A-M-A-S. Mm-hmm. And it's an edible tuber. And that used to be like a native food for the area. Huh. Yeah. I'm but learning, you wouldn't I'm just you wouldn't know about that unless you you know like got started in a book like this. So does that represent just like the Sioux Nation, like foods around wherever they habit habitated, Li- like lived? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what am I trying? <laughs> Where they live? I think it's inhabited. 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 Thank yeah. you. I'm so sorry. I'm so tired. No, no worries. <laughs> I know. So I'm um, not even gonna cut that out. No, say. leave it. <laughs> it is pretty focused on like the prairie and lakes region okay. so there's not a lot of things that would have been like um on the west coast or well i mean like there's things like bison and stuff that are definitely mm-hmm. from here or um you know like we have sage grouse that could sub in for for pheasant but um what you're really not going to find are things like uh california sagebrush is edible but like there's no sagebrush recipe in here right so but for most of the U.S., most of the U.S. is prairie and lake okay. area. So, yeah, it would be pretty regionally ap- uh, applicable to everyone. Okay. Sweet. Yeah. Jay, uh-huh. what do you got over there? Okay. Well, so I bought, I brought, this is a good time to bring this one up because oh, yeah. this is James Beard. So I brought this one um, because I, my mom gave me this and it wasn't actually um, a gift from her to me. It was a gift from my dad to my mom on her birthday. My mom's birthday is on Halloween. So October 31st, 1974. Were you even born? No. No. (laughs) Will you share the title really fast on that? Yeah. So this is Beard on Bread. I love the look of that book. Isn't it fun? Yeah. It's old. And so pretty. Yeah. My mom knows I love cookbooks. She really likes cookbooks too. Um, But she gave me this just a few years ago because I was interested in starting to do bread making, Mm -hmm. which I haven't really done a lot of. I, I, I haven't spent a lot of time doing it, um, but I'm interested in it. And so I, this is a fun one to flip through. I really just like reading cookbooks. I don't know why. Same. That's just so too. interesting yeah. to me. But do you, so, count it, do you count it on your good reads? I, I just need to well, know. Well, there's I mean, maybe been ones that are more like um, maybe what Taryn's talking about, like hybrid cookbooks slash like. Um, memoir like years right. like yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. yeah so those all count I would not probably count this um, bread you know cookbook but it's really interesting and then I was going through and looking at it and my mom made notes in it oh and like the things she liked she put good next to some of them and she had adjusted the recipes on some of them and so that to me is just super fun to look at like in 1974 what was my mom baking I what was she excited about out of this book yeah. So this one's fun. I think n- probably not necessarily to make a bunch of stuff out of, but just really to look at and something that's been passed down. And I love that my dad wrote in the front of it. Super yeah. cute. Sounds like it's full of good marginalia. I, I think it is. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. Well, so that's that. super fun. Um, and then I brought, this is one that Rob gifted to me um, after we watched the documentary Forks Over Knives. Right. So this is the Forks Over Knives cookbook. And the Forks Over Knives documentary, it was fascinating to me. Um, We watched it quite a while ago, quite a number of years ago. But it's all about plant-based eating and how much healthier that is for us and the planet and, Mm -hmm. you know, and all that. And so... I like this cookbook a lot, but we were kind of laughing after he gave it to me. I tried a few recipes out of it. And these are definitely (laughs) the like, you might need to go to the store for some ingredients you've not heard of, or um, it wants you to start your pot of beans in the morning and lovingly stir it all day (laughs) until they're done. (laughs) And so I made a few recipes out of it and I would get done with the recipe and Rob would be like you've been in the kitchen all day (laughs) which I find fun sometimes but you know not like on a school night when you're trying to like you know we just need to eat and so but the things I've made out of here are very good and it's another fun one just to kind of look through to see like well what are they making and they're doing a lot of things um 
vegetarian that or plant-based that um, are replacements. So I like to think of the like forks over knives, sorry, the um, thug kitchen as just a here's a whole foods, like you're going to eat the cauliflower tacos or whatever. Mm -hmm. That's what it is. In the forks over knives, there's, you know, like vegan mac and cheese and stuff where you're trying Mm -hmm. to mimic more of the the non-plant-based recipes, I guess. Um, So that's kind of fun if that's what you're looking for or if you're looking to spend a day in the kitchen. (laughs) (laughs) If you have nothing better to do. But sometimes I don't have anything better to do and I do want to do that. So this is a good cookbook to pull out for that. Yeah. But that might happen once a year. Yeah. You know. Yeah. I'm trying to think if it happens for me. (laughs) (laughs) I like to cook. I just, I don't want to be in there all day. No. So anyway, it's fun. I like that one. And I recommend the documentary if um, people are interested in plant-based eating and the benefits of plant-based eating. Cool. Okay. So this one I brought, um, I love. Oh, I recognize her. (laughs) Yeah. So this is the Sprinkles Baking Book. And um, my mom also gave me this book as a gift. I really love to bake. I probably started loving to bake before I really started to love to cook. And... Um, This is all recipes from the Sprinkles brand of cupcakes, and they have their Sprinkles stores um, in, like, the Southern California area, and I think there might be some, like, in Texas, or I don't know. They're sprinkled Mm -hmm. sprinkled around. (laughs) They are. (laughs) Is there one at at Disney? I think there is one at Disney, and I think she even pioneered a a cupcake dispenser machine. It's an ATM, a cupcake ATM. Yeah, Yeah. Yeah. okay. No way. Uh So exciting, huh? Okay, have you been to one? Has anybody been? We've been. Mm -hmm. I mean, because we go to Disney a lot. We happened to walk past it on the way to the gluten-free bakery, but I mean... We see it all the time, and there's huge lines at the one at Disney. Yes. Well, there is one in Newport Beach where my parents live. So this is how I got introduced to the whole idea. And I also am really a sucker for sweets. I love baked goods and sweets. Mm -hmm. So when I saw the cupcake shop, I was like, well, I want to go there. So we did, and I loved it. I mean, the cupcakes are really great. And so... um, So we visit there pretty much every time I go to see my parents. And then sometimes my parents, if they come up here, they'll try to transport a few cupcakes up, you know, (laughs) make a special trip to get them. I have to ask this because sometimes when we go to like the gourmet um, cupcake shops here, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't love like they're really dense. Right, I don't. These are not. These are light and fluffy. No. The frosting is amazing. It's not that like stick super, to the roof of your yeah, mouth super like sweet. after tasty yeah it's not like yeah. that which is why I think I fell in love with them because I'm the same as you I don't love what yeah. we have here no I don't mm-hmm. love any of the places no. we have here so I um tried a recipe out of here I actually made a um, cake for my own birthday oh ooh, <laughs> because if I want a homemade birthday cake then that's yeah. what has to happen but right. I like doing it so I made it and I wasn't really sure what to expect and it tasted exactly like what you would get at the Sprinkles really? Cupcake oh, Store. Wow. Yeah, so I tried a few other recipes. I've made a few things for people's birthdays. And um, there's also some subs in here for making vegan cupcakes, gluten-free cupcakes. There's cookies in here. So it's not all just 100%, you know, your flour-based cupcakes. Cool. I, I love that. Super impressed. And I recognize her. She's the one of the judges on the Cupcake Wars. Yeah, I haven't seen that show because we got rid of cable, I mm-hmm. guess, probably right around the time that stuff was happening. So I have mm-hmm. not really seen that. I do. Right. I, I don't miss cable, but sometimes I miss the Food Network because I do love a good <laughs> cooking show. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, I don't. I think it's still on. I don't know, because we're like you. We took a page out of the Rob and Jamie notebook, and we got rid of cable also. Yay. So we were almost a year that we haven't had it. So, uh, But before that, I recognized her on there, and I yeah. used to love that. Yeah. She definitely brought cupcakes back to like it's the world. It's definitely yeah. a thing. I mean, because there are other places that have done reality shows. Like there's a place in DC that was doing sisters that were doing cupcakes. And I don't remember who they were, but yeah, it seems, seems to be a, a thing. Yeah. Right. And I do think it was her. I think she's the one who kind of popular. People jumped, oh, on, I think so. jumped mm-hmm. on the mm-hmm. the movement of the bandwagon. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, for sure. Tammy, what do you got over there? Well, I brought in a couple that we have talked about. Um, the Joy of Cooking was one that my dad gave me, and it has rubber bands around I it because see. it's falling apart. Falling apart. And he and I used to cook. You know, we had competitions for like the best scalloped potatoes or the best spaghetti sauce. And um, this one is, it's not a fun cookbook <laughs> because it's there there are only drawings in it there are no pictures and that's kind of a an yeah. issue for me I'd like to see a picture of me the too. item I agree uh, instead of just a hand drawn thing but this is really about a person who wants to become very serious about cooking so it's all about the technique mm. and then my dad gave me the quintessential better homes and gardens the new cookbook that's the um, red and white checker but um, I wanted to talk about and I brought others um the oldest one, and there's a funny story about this one. It's just, it's called um, Cookie Cookbook. And it is an old cookbook. And we had this growing up, and every cookie we made was in this cookbook. Really? Well, there was only one copy. And then I was in an antique store, and I happened to be going through, just, you know, breezing through the cookbook section. And here it was. <gasps> So it was like $4 or something like that. And I was super excited because then one of my other sisters could have the original. And this was then, you know, the one that we had. That's so great. And some of them I've switched to gluten-free. But I guess I just am hanging on to it because. It's sentimental. It is sentimental. Mm -hmm. But I think what I want to talk about for really the my book for this issue um, of cookbooks is the gluten-free on a shoestring by Nicole Hun. And she is a blogger. She's a food blogger and she has a child that's gluten-free. And this, I think she has maybe five cookbooks now and I just automatically purchase them when I see a new one and I follow her blog and I get her newsletter and, and recipes and things. And she, we've also communicated, which I think is great. She'll answer emails. And, and the one issue that's tough for us is we're at high elevation. And her, she is from the, the sea East level. Coast, sea level, yeah. very sea level. She's just north of New York City, I think. And so when I mentioned to her that some of the things don't turn out very well, and could she help with making the changes for high altitude, she was like, I'm so sorry, I can't. I don't have any way of replicating that. And she said, I don't have anyone you know, to do that. And so um, I just have to kind of pay attention to that. And sometimes mm -hmm. the first time doesn't turn out great, but then the second time I get, a, I have a little cheat sheet and I'll fix it. But what I like is that these are kind of everyday things um, and it's all things. So it's entrees and it's baked goods because I'm like you, Jamie, I used to love to bake, baked all the time, baked bread, you know, baked pies, things. And it's just harder gluten-free. It's like a chemistry experiment. And I got a D in chemistry, so, <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's not my forte. But I love her cookbooks. And she has done one that's um, uh, gluten-free on a shoestring, does snacks. And she's taken all of like the Nabisco cookies and Girl Scout cookies and all of those things. And she's made really a mock gluten-free one. So that's um, kind of fun. So I just, I wanted to give a shout out to Nicole Hunt and her gluten-free on a shoestring. That's cool. That looks great. Yeah, I know. You guys, now all you did is just made me hungry. <laughs> <laughs> and it's late in the day. It's, thank God you gave me the pecans. I would not have survived. <laughs> <laughs> well, it is fun to talk about cookbooks. I, I know this was kind of my idea, but I, I think it's really fun to just think what's out there, whether it's the you know literary cookbook or full of recipes. I actually brought two cookbooks home thinking we were going to talk there. Mm -hmm. And then this morning we did the whole switcheroo to here. And I've of course left the books there because, you know, like not everything's connected right now, <laughs> but I brought the Magnolia table cause I love Chip oh, and right. Joanna. Yeah. And then I have this like food memoir thing called, um, something about singing well with burnt toast. I don't know. I'll find, I'll find the title and put it in okay that those magnolia are, one yeah. has um a really good chocolate chip cookie recipe in it really that's one i checked out from the library and i was <laughs> like and there's a lot of stuff in there that's meat that i'm not going to cook and so that's sometimes what i'll do with cookbooks like that yeah and so i copied the i stole the you chocolate stole chip the cookie chocolate recipe chip out yeah. of it before i, I returned you. it to the library i don't blame you at all that's well, a good one next year you'll be here so if you need it again thank you sitting right here on the shelf but those two are at my house I think, honestly, if you hand wrote it down, you'd probably be 100% fine. I, and I totally yeah, hand wrote did. it down. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I did not take a picture That's of right. it. Yeah. <laughs> right? 
Thanks for listening today. We hope you enjoyed our discussions of cookbooks and all yummy things food related. And we're bringing you more cookbook recommendations on our Friday for this week from the Cirque Desk. Before we go, check us out on social media. We're on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. We know you like us, so if you'll head over to Podchaser and CastBox and leave us a review, that helps others find our show. And if you're listening on Apple, you can click right here in the show notes below for all the links to all these fabulous cookbooks. See See you in the the stacks! stacks. (laughs) 